Hey everybody, welcome to Voided Transmissions. I am your host, Jason Brazier, and I am very excited today to have WWE Hall of Famer and wrestling legend Gerald Briscoe on the show. Jerry, thanks for being here, man. I know it's been a tough one for us to get this recording going. <laughs> well, Jason, you know, you learn something every day. So, uh, you know, I, 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 you learn not to trust 100% technology. But you know what? You and I figured it out. So here we are. So let's roll. That's right. Well, um, I, I grew up watching you and uh, Pat Patterson during the Attitude Era. And as I got older, I kind of dove into wrestling history and learned a lot about you. And so you seem to, and I didn't know this early on, but you uh, had quite the successful amateur wrestling career. Am I right? Yeah, I had a pretty good career at, uh, at Oklahoma State University. I was a scholarship wrestler there, and we, I was fortunate enough to be with a group of guys that uh, our team won two national titles while we were there. So uh it was it was a good run, but uh, and I I learned so much and the work ethic that I picked up there I think carried on to my professional career. I had guys like two time Olympic champion Yojo Yutaki, three time undefeated uh, national champion Jay Robinson, who uh, went on to coach the University of Minnesota four national titles, Fred Fozard, who became one of the first uh, first uh, USA freestyle world champion. So. The room was just loaded. Plus, uh, the the coach, Coach Myron Roderick, was was just uh, way beyond his time, you know, and coaching methods and and developing developing good attitudes and work ethic. Well, that's awesome. And um, so, how did you get involved with professional wrestling? Then, what was that journey like to go from the amateur to professional? Well, I was very fortunate, as you know, doing your research, my brother Jack, you know, he was also at Oklahoma State University on national championship, an individual mm -hmm. national championship. And uh, as we were growing up in a little small town uh, called Blackwell, Oklahoma, it, our, our next door neighbors is Perry, Oklahoma. And any astute wrestling fan knows Perry, Oklahoma, from the world famous, the great Danny Hodge. Dana Hodge mm -hmm. was an amateur wrestler and and went on to become one of the uh, the greatest uh, uh, professional wrestlers of all time. So he was kind of the role model and kind of the the, the person that we wanted to kind of model our, our our life and career around. So we had really good uh, mentors at, during that time. Well, that's awesome. What was one of your? Do you recall one of your favorite uh, matches that you ever had over at Oklahoma City? Uh, uh, Stillwater actually is Stillwater, Oklahoma, Oklahoma. Stillwater, State. yeah, sorry, but uh, but uh, yeah, um, we we uh, I, I, I've wrestled a lot of open tournaments, and uh, I, I I was fortunate, uh, or unfortunate, as, as you say, as you want to say, I took third place, and uh, but in that third place, I wrestled four matches, I lost one match, and then I pinned the other three guys, and I, I, was, I was awarded a third place member the most fall and the uh, least amount of time trophy. So that was really one of my highlights of, of, of my career. Well, that's awesome. So, and if I remember reading correctly, um, did you, uh, your, did your brother have a tag team match over here in Missouri and his tag team partner couldn't be there. And so you filled in. Well, that's, that's basically how I started. Of course, Jack started three years earlier than I did. So during the summertime and during, uh, uh, you know, holiday breaks like Christmas or whenever I wasn't wrestling, that spring breaks, usually I would drive the ring truck around uh, for Leroy McGurk and set up the ring and set up the arena because he ran a lot of what they called spot shows, outdoor shows back in those days. So mm -hmm. I was around the guys a lot. So they got to know me a little bit and knew I was in school wrestling and some of them would want to learn a little bit about amateur wrestling. So we would trade knowledge, uh, you know, I'd get in the ring with them and, and then I'd show them a little uh, uh, amateur wrestling and in return, they'd show me a little little professional wrestling. So we were up in Joplin, Missouri hmm. on spring break one year and Jack's partner was Gorgeous George Jr. And they were wrestling the assassins, Jody Hamilton and Tom, Tom Ernesto. So uh, 
the night before uh, uh, Gorgeous George Jr., who was Jack's regular tag team partner, got hurt, uh, uh, broke his ankle. So we went to Joplin the next night, and, of course, George wasn't there. So, well, what are we going to do? The promoter promoter starts asking around, and one of them, Jody Hamilton said, well, the kid over there, he he knows a little bit. I, I think we could we could we could we could get him through a match here. So uh, they came over to ask me, and I, of course I wanted to go. You know, get a payday too. You know, so mm-hmm. I said, sure, I'll try it. You know, it was exciting for me. So uh, so I borrowed a pair of Jack's tights and somebody else's boots. We went out and we had a tag team match. It was my first uh, first ever first ever match. We didn't win, but you know, I had my first match. Well, that's awesome. And Joplin's just out, in, not that far in my backyard. So yeah, it is. Yeah, Joplin. Uh, Joplin will go down to Springfield and Joplin. We mm-hmm. ride and work a lot of those Missouri towns, and I love them both. And during the summer, we go over Table Rock uh, around what what is it? Around uh, Table Rock uh, Lake mm-hmm. over there. And, uh, yeah, near Branson. Yeah. Yeah, and enjoy ourselves, you know, on summer break and everything. So I'm I'm very familiar with that part of the country. Oh, that's awesome. That's cool. Um, so, uh, was there a particular professional wrestler that you re- that really inspired you, or uh, it, it, maybe there was more than just one? Yeah, well, like, like I said, Danny Hodge, Hodge was yeah. the guy. You know, he was the guy we looked up to. And but as as we got going, too, Danny stayed that mentor and stayed a re- real dear close friend uh, of of ours. But we, of course, had other friends. You know, and we I made friends uh, with uh, with uh, Jody Hamilton, who was. One of the brightest minds ever, and his partner Tom Renesso, they were the the top bad guy heel tag team in the, in, the, in, the, in the state. So, as I was traveling around, I would always kind of go over and talk to them, just kind of get all the knowledge that I could because you know I, I wanted to, to to make it, and those guys were willing to share share their knowledge with me with the young guy. So there were a lot of guys like that. Leroy McGurk had a lot of older guys into the, in mm-hmm. his territory because. As a, as the the historians out there know, Leroy was blind, so I think Leroy kind of remembered the guys he brought in as twenty or thirty years younger, you know, and the young guys instead of the old pro veteran pros that they become. Mm-hmm. But they also had that knowledge, and if you wanted to learn, but that, that was the greatest learning tree, you know, probably I've ever been around. That's awesome. Well, and at some point, when did you go full time pro? What was it that made you go full time? Well, I got out of school. <laughs> I actually, <laughs> I, I lost my scholarship because I, I two years in a row, I one one year I hurt my knee, mm-hmm. and, and I, I couldn't couldn't complete the season. The next year, I came down with infectious hepatitis right before wrestling season would, was starting, and I had to go in the hospital and in, in confinement, you know, for like like three weeks and when I got out I was so weak and I'd lost so much weight that I basically had to drop out of school because they didn't want people with hepatitis you know in in the classroom with everybody else so I had to drop out of school for for that semester so the next year I come back and Roderick called me into the office and, you know you haven't been here in two years well I had to give your scholarship up you're you're welcome to stay on the team and all that stuff but you know I can't can't give you any financial aid well my mom was a single mom of, of six kids, so uh, mm. you know she couldn't afford uh, yeah. to send me to school. And so, you know, what am I going to do? I'm going to. And I called my brother and said, "Jack, I lost my scholarship on on turn pro." And my mom hated it, but my brother said, "Come on over." <laughs> yeah. Well, and what was it like traveling the road and being um, your brother's tag team partner for the, that all that time? Well, uh, you know, I really wasn't Jack's tag team partner a lot uh, in the early oh, really? days because he 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 wanted he wanted to make some money too, so he took off from Oklahoma because Oklahoma was considered one of those old territories where, you know, there wasn't a lot of money to be made in there. So he took off. He went to a couple of different places. So kind of left me on my own until I I kind of. Finished my school year up because I had to do that for my mom, you know, uh, yeah. to turn pro. And so, uh, so I kind of finished my school year up. And then uh, through his connections, I got a trip to Japan, a trip to Australia, which I was supposed to go there for three months, but it turned into a, a, a eleven month uh, tour over there, which I, I loved it over there and would have stayed forever if, if they would have let me. But uh, I joined the National Guard to keep 
from going to Vietnam, to be quite mm -hmm. honest. And uh, I mm -hmm. got a letter said, if you don't get back here, you're going to, you know, your draft board's going to have your number right away. So, <laughs> of course, the letter went to my mom and she called in a panic. You're going to have to go to Vietnam if you don't come back, blah, blah, blah. But she was glad I was coming back. So I come back and I did my did my my obligation to the national guard and then i i took off uh to carolina and that's where i first started and i was a single dresser there because jack was in florida by that time so uh mm -hmm, mm -hmm. he was down here making making a name for himself we we're very fortunate that i was in carolina making a name for myself both territories were doing really good and you know drawing a lot of people well, who comes along is the Funk Brothers, you know, and all of a sudden tag team with Jack and Dory and, and Terry and me. And so uh -huh. we we got to start that thing, you know, and then we got to share two territories, actually three with Amarillo. Then Lana became a, a partner in, in, the, in the, the make, too. So it was quite a good deal for me. Well, over the I said, I think if you guys held over 20 tag team championships during your professional run. Is that correct? I'm not sure. I mean, uh, sure. you know, we were fortunate. Uh, the promoters had a lot of trust in us, needless to say, and and, and they 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 put us in a position to, uh, to to take take the tag team title. So we were very fortunate that the promoters just believed in that we could we could make them some money, or that would have never happened. Yeah. Well, what what do you think made you and your brother so successful when you guys started doing tag teaming more often? Well, I think the skill level, number one, we're both very skilled. I mean, uh, Jack was, you know, a heavyweight world champion. I was a junior heavyweight world champion. So we're both very skilled at what we do. And we had a unique style where we weren't the brothers. We weren't, we weren't the, you know, high flyers. We were wrestlers. Everybody said, what's your gimmick? Well, you need a gimmick. Well, we got a gimmick. We're wrestlers, you know. And there yeah. wasn't a lot of college <laughs> wrestlers around at the time. So yeah. it was just a combination of being young and being athlete and athletic and, and, and having a good foundation of amateur wrestling that kind of that set us apart from the ordinary professional wrestling team, I think. Well, are there any uh, funny stories from the road that come to mind? Well, there, there's a lot, you know, a lot you can't tell from the road, but you know, <laughs> a funny, funny one from inside the ring and just how guys, you know, the ribbon, you, I'm, I'm sure you've heard of the ribbon, you know, guys pull oh, yeah. each other a lot. Oh, yeah. Know? Oh, yeah. We're, we're, we're in, uh, I believe it's New Orleans, Louisiana, at the, at the St. Bernard Parish, brand new building at that time. Uh -huh. Really nice, about five, 6,000 people attendance and, uh, we had the place packed. It was Jack and I wrestling against Buddy Coat, one of the well-known hills from the Missouri area, I might add. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And his partner, Danny Jack Donovan, who was a grizzled old veteran that was really skilled in what he did. They were tag team champions, and Jack and I earned a shot to go against them for the tag team championships. It was my basically my very first big main event where there was five six thousand people packed house in there, you know. So I'm 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 just jacked to the gills, you know, and in excitement and everything, so wanting to go and everything. So the the heels go out first, uh, and then we come out next, you know, and a thunderous uh, 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 applause and all that stuff. You know, the goosebumps start flowing because it, it's it's exciting mm -hmm. to walk out and feel the reaction of the, of the fans out, out in the audience. It's, it's really a adrenaline maker there. So yeah, we jump in the ring and uh, Danny Jack Donovan uh, tells Jack, hit him, hit him. Well, he got his belt on around his waist. So Jack goes and uh, as he goes over there, Danny Jack, uh, uh, you know, pops the belt from his waist there. So Jack nails him in and the belt a couple of times. Buddy Coach Hunter, hit me, hit me, hit me. So I'm thinking the same thing. So I don't see Buddy's belt. So I just, I, I'm, I'm a rookie. I, I'm a dummy. I just think, you know, <laughs> he's not wearing a belt. Maybe he forgot his belt or something. I go over there and I, I give him my best punch into the stomach. I hit that damn chair. He had his championship belt all underneath his jacket and the oh. grab on me to get me to do it. And I hurt my, I broke my hand, broke my knuckles on my head. <laughs> oh <laughs> man. And then when we got back, he just started laughing. He said, that's how hard you hit me in the face every time you hit me. So I wanted to teach you a lesson. So that was a lesson learned, you know, be, watch what be wearing my punches. They wouldn't let me punch for the like first eight months. And I was in the business because I was so stiff. <laughs> Oh man, that's crazy. Um, 
let's see here. Um, so after your after your in ring career, you took um, kind of a backstage role with the what was the then the WWF. Um, what was it like in the early days when you were backstage? Working oh, it was, it was it was like it was like pioneering days because all of it was brand new. I mean, uh, Vince was going national. You know, it wasn't the first. You know, because back in the Chicago days, back in the fifties <coughs> on Dumont TV, they had uh, they had national TV. But it was the first time that that uh, that organized crew went around the nation together. You know, so it was it was really a, a pioneering thing. And my first job with the WWE was was a local promoter because Vance was having trouble getting into a lot of markets there. And so we wanted somebody local, you know, that knew the building people. And I, you know, had stock in Florida Championship and Georgia Championship and was really familiar in the Carolina. So mm -hmm. I had all those connections he was seeking. So I became a local promoter. Mm. And during that course of time, you know, I would always get good cards because I had good markets like Miami, Tampa, Atlanta, and stuff like that. So I, you know, I had Hogan a lot of time. Well, Hogan, I'd help Hogan get started in the business. So he would do all the lo local radio station for me as kind of a payback and kind of help me. Well, my town were doing better than anybody else's towns in the country. Vince took a notice of that. He said, hey, you know, maybe we should bring you up to the main office up there. So that's basically how I got my opportunity to go to the main office after about five or six years of doing local promotion for him. Oh, okay. So um, when you first went, uh, you know, to the office, did you, were you, were you backstage a lot at the events or? Did well, that was my primary job was working with the talent backstage. I was intimidated mm -hmm. as hell too, as long as I'd been in the business at point and as successful as I'd been, I was still intimidated by the, by the monster that I could see that was looking over my shoulder all the time, you know? And uh, so it was, it was an intimidating time, but you know, I like to say I got my PhD while I was working for Vance. I mean, it was that bride of a man where, you know, you could like, I was always wanting more knowledge about the business and, and he, he had so much, he has so much knowledge about the business. It's unbelievable. So it was, it was, it was another great learning experience for me. And I, I felt like, but I felt like I carried my load and I contributed as much as anybody else there. So, it, it was, it was, we had a great team effort. We had uh, Pat Patterson, of course. We had yeah. Bruce Richard, of course. We had mm -hmm. Jim Ross. We had, we just had a plethora of, of geniuses to our talent present yeah. and, and, and on your shoulder and helping each other out. So it was a great teamwork and we all got along pretty good. And, uh, you know, you, when you got a bunch of creative people and a bunch of, Alpha's in, in the room, you're, you're going to have your, your arguments and stuff like that. But that's what Vince was there for, to, to tell us which one was right and wrong and why we were right or wrong, you know. So, yeah, we had a good we had a good team. It was all team effort. Well, good. It's like, so what was it like? Like, So the intimidation of some of these wrestlers, I mean, I'm sure, you, I mean, I know you definitely ran into Andre most uh, quite a few oh, times. Yeah. Uh, you know, what was he like to you? Because I hear so many different stories about him. Andre was one of, one of my best friends, or one of, I wouldn't say best friends, but one of my awesome friends. One of the guys that I knew that would have my back no matter what, you know, because Andre and I went back, you know, many, many years before he was, you know, the WrestleMania Andre the Giant. But, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. he was a true giant. And, you know, I mean, he was so much fun to be around. Such a... Uh, a giant personality on top of a giant body. The guy enjoyed life and enjoyed having a good time. And they, that made him a great guy to be around a great, great traveling partner. That's awesome. Well, and I've heard a lot of, I heard a lot of stories from Mike Pappas about him because him and Mike traveled the roads right. quite a lot, you know, and Mike being the little guy he was and Andre being the big guy he was, that was always that was a, a combination because I've seen them on the road before together. So Mike, Mike, Mike was leveling with you on that stuff. And God bless Mike sold. I mean, he's a yeah. small guy. And, uh, but Andre loved him to death. And, uh, you know, they, when they would, they would travel together. I mean, it was much Jeff team all together. I mean, it was, it was, it was great to see him like that. And Andre, Andre loved Mike. Oh yeah. And it's the stories that Mike would tell about him. It was just so warming to hear these stories too, because I've also heard the stories about who, if Andre, the giant did not, if he didn't like you, you knew it. <laughs> yeah. It was just a hundred percent opposite. You know, if he liked you, you knew he didn't like you. If he didn't like, you, he wasn't one to. Yeah. I heard, 
I, I heard that he wasn't very fond of Randy Savage. Is that true? Do you know? Well, I, you know, when I was around Randy and, and Andre, it was they had to respect business wife for each other, but no, they didn't go out partying after after yeah. the events together or anything like Andre would like to do. So, uh, so yeah, there there was a little heat there, but you know, once again, I was doing local promotions at time that time, mm-hmm. so I wasn't on the road twenty four seven like uh, like I was later on. Yeah. Well, so when WCW and Ted Turner came into play and the Monday Night Wars began, which is right when I was the perfect age, because I um, I would flip back and forth between WCW and back and forth between Monday Night Nitro and Raw, because I just knew that both parties were probably watching the other show and trying to top each other. You know what I mean? And it always seemed like that to me. So what was it like during the Monday night war era being backstage? Well, I'll tell you something. We certainly knew everything that WCW did. And of course they knew everything that we did, but uh-huh. we didn't, we didn't base our, our, our booking and our creative on, on what they were doing. Mm-hmm. We based it on what we thought was the best, best talent at that time with the best uh, creative that we could possibly get them at the time. Did it all work? No, but once it started working, a lot of us started clicking more, more, more successes and failures. In the beginning, they were kicking our ass and uh, we didn't have many successes, but you know, Vince, Vince stayed his, his vision and directed us to stay to our vision. Forget what you see over there. Forget what you read that's going on over there. It's not mm-hmm. going to help us draw one dime. Yeah. Be creative. Come up with your own suggestion. Come up with your own creative style. Or don't copy anybody else's. So he kept us on that straight path. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, we just kept uh, kept on that vision. And then pretty soon we started picking up. And pretty soon we started kicking ass again. So during that, during, and you guys did, even when you guys were during that, it was at the 83 weeks that WCW won in the ratings. I still was going back and back to you watching you guys. Cause you guys were always pulling out stuff like when stone cold and versus Vince. And then when D generation X started, um, what were those? Did you guys have like any pitch meetings and stuff for like DX and all that? And who came up with what for that? And I mean, did Sean or, Hunter pitched those things to you guys, or did you guys come up with that? Well, I, I, you know, some of it was come up with by by our creative, but you know, any successful faction or any successful character has to be a spinoff of a chip of the personality that's doing it, mm-hmm. and it's hard or it's hard. It's not impossible because we had we had some and have some talented writers that, that could pick up that, but. Uh, we just kind of played along, and 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 Sean and and Hunter were kind of the directors of it, and Sean Waltman was was a very, very uh, bright, mm-hmm. astute young man that had a lot of younger ideals too that he was able to mm-hmm. to stick mm-hmm. in there also. So it was more of a create a, a unified effort. But you know, all the credit for for DX basically goes on the shoulders of of the two guys that we met there, Sean and and and, and Hunter there. Well, that's awesome. And I, yeah, and <laughs> it was during that time period. I know that Vince and WWF um, came under a lot of fire for all the DX stuff. That they oh, were, yeah. That yeah. We had, what, what was that? Parents, you know, uh, Again, parents yeah. against the uh, violence on TV. And we were fighting <laughs> them every week. We we're fighting PETA. We we're fighting the World uh-huh. Federation. <laughs> and be, and it, the only reason we we're fighting them because we started gaining momentum. You know, yeah, when you get yeah. momentum, a lot of people come out. Well, before when we were nothing, none of those organizations even stepped foot. But once we started making a, a dent in, in the pop culture world, and then all of a sudden we become the bad guys. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and all those organizations start popping up on us. Oh, yeah. Well, and it was just funny, too. My dad would always be like, you know, I don't want to hear about you doing that DX crotch chop yeah, and all yeah. that. And I was the only one at school that never got caught doing it. So I always think it's funny. <laughs> you, you were the second one, probably. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, well, yeah. Well, yeah. Somebody else did it. Well, sure, I could do it better. Boom. Then our teacher <laughs> turned around. Exactly. That's, what, yeah, that's, that's how you do it. <laughs> um, so whenever you and Pat started coming out, um on camera more with Vince during that era. Um, did he pitch the idea to you guys to be his like on screen assistants or who's 
Do you remember whose idea that was, or was that just yeah, kind, well, of that's organic? A, it kind of organically came around, Jason? Because uh, you know we we were we were you know we were we were Vince's you know main honchos backstage basically, you know, and so mm -hmm. so uh, every time there was a lot a lot of interaction between Vince and Pat and I, and a lot of times cameras would catch it on there. Yeah. So uh, we did one thing. It was it's, it's so cold. It was I believe it was in Chicago, and you know how rabid you've seen shows from Chicago. You know how mm -hmm. rabid those fans are up there. Oh yeah. So oh yeah. We 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 were we were backstage trying to plot against Stone Cold, and it was being fed to the audience, and well, oh, what a reaction, you know. And from that reaction, and uh, you yeah, give me credit, Vince Russo, man, that 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 segment got over and it got over with the national audience also with the numbers that we produced so so the next week we just did another one and it it started getting over and it kind of organically came but it was basically vent russo's idea to, to put that thing together like that well that was great because i love seeing you guys come out there because i knew when you guys were out there i would get a you guys were like a really good balance between yeah. the craziness and you guys you and pat kind of added this kind of soft comedy routine to it yeah we're the comedic part of it now you just piss pat off so much you know, <laughs> because both of us worked worked our entire careers and oh yeah serious in the ring you know and here we are you know old old guys and, and uh and all of a sudden we're we're and it, it was so funny how we kind of morphed into the Stooges because the first we were Vince's associate, you know, board, 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 me, a board director, a board, on uh -huh. the board, board of yeah. directors. Then we were his associates, then it kind of morphed into the Stooges, and nobody wanted to call us Stooges. And finally, there was a meeting one day, and and Vince asked outright, "Is it okay if we call you guys the Stooges?" I thought it was funny as hell, and I said, "Sure, I don't care." <laughs> And yeah. Pat, Pat was kind of, he was kind of stiffer about it, you know, because I used to kid him all the time. Pat, we worked our entire career to be t taken serious. And here we are, we're being on the rest of our careers as students. And we are, I mean, very <laughs> few people know that Pat and I had to sell the career in the ring before we were dead to students. Yeah. Well, you know, if, it, if it's, you know, and I wish I would have had a chance to have met or talked to Pat too along, but you know, it's. What um, a brilliant man he was. So. Yeah. And the thing is though, even though, and, and I, if he's hearing this, I would love for him to be able to hear this. It's the fact that you guys were on screen that made me go back and dig into your history. Yeah. You know, and that to me was um, very, very motivating and very nice. I just like, you know, learn. it made me want to go back and learn more about you guys. And yeah. So I, well, you know. I think a lot of people did that, you know, and that, that's what I was proud of, you know, because I think I, I Pat and I doing that character, because then the other, you know, then, you know well, I mean, those early days there were very, very little social media where you can go back and do research on, but you know, right during that time, we we're also blessed with the, with the birth of all this stuff that we're doing now, you know, and so people yeah. were go, able to go back, you know, with the YouTube and stuff like that and see mm -hmm. what we were all about. And see the ring uh, skill that Pat Patterson had in the ring. See the skill that I had in the ring. You know, so oh yeah. Ring. Well, I, yeah. Well, I even remember there was a match that happened on Raw where you and him had to were tag team in. I can't, I can't for the life of me remember who you guys tag team against. But Main Street Posse. That's who it was. Yes, yeah. and I remember you guys came out to the, oh, the old Hulk Hogan music. I think. It yeah, was. real American. American. You know, I, and I, I figured that was me. I figured, you know, I'm, I'm a Native American. I am a real American. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and I, I, I loved it. And that's what one of the T-shirts that I need to get still is I need yeah. to get a Briscoe Brothers. Yeah, shirt. That's one. And of the by the way, I've that that seg that segment was led in by uh, John Layfield and Ron Simmons, who John uh -huh. has my podcast partner. But that yeah. that segment had the highest at that time, the highest rated segment of all time. Uh, over eight point six million people tuned into that segment. Yeah, well, it was it it was just it was it was just a wonderful time in wrestling. I just you know I I, I look back on all of that with just. A big it was fun. It was fun. We, we had fun. Oh yeah, fans had fun. Oh yeah, and I and I even remember too that you had the really nice shirt 
that said Briscoe Brothers Garage, yeah. and then Pat had this white shirt, if I recall, and it looked like somebody had taken like a sharpie and put first Intercontinental Champion. Yeah, first I see champion. champion. Yeah, Pat, Pat, Pat made that shirt. That was Pat's. <laughs> I died. I, every time I look, I laugh. Uh, I, it brings a big smile on my face. I just love you guys. You and guys. if you look at it close on the way out, Pat's got a cigarette behind his ear. Does he really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, I want to go back and watch that. And my wife, you know, it was really funny because when you guys started WWE Network, uh, my wife was like, Jason, what was that era of wrestling that you like to watch? And I said, oh, you mean the Attitude Era when I grew up and watching in the Monday Night War? She goes, yeah. She goes, can we watch that? And I was <laughs> like, oh, I knew I married you for a reason. And yes, <laughs> yeah, it's WWE Network. <laughs> Network. And we sat down, and I mean, we just started back right from, like, when the attitude era really started the first wow. match that I can remember. And we just sit down and watch it. And she, and I got to re enjoy, I got to enjoy it again. She got to like live it for the first time and see oh, all the different things. And that's awesome. You know, and you know, she would always, she always would get so into the, um, the, like the matches That's what made it so much fun to watch with her. Even if I took her to a live match, she just gets so into it. And she's just like, makes it a lot more fun for me. And just reminds me of how I, you know, that's how I was whenever right. I first started yeah. watching it. And, you know, she would always, you know, I told her, so well, I'm going to be talking to Jerry Briscoe. And she's like, are you serious? That's amazing. Uh -huh. I love it. You know? And um, so you guys, with what you guys did was just amazing. And, and real quick to what, with what do you what do you think of the wrestling landscape now? Because obviously things have changed over time. Obviously, with more of the sports entertainment aspect of it, what is it that has changed for the better and for the and and man, I don't want to say for the worse, but for like where you guys think wrestling now could improve the, for the future? Well, that, that's a great question. Uh, 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 first part of it, uh, you know, I what I watch, I watch modern day wrestling now, and uh, it's so different as as you said, and uh, you said very quickly. It's hard to do this very quickly because it's it, it's a passion of mine, a, a business that I love. But mm -hmm. it it's so fast moving now, and that, I think that that that's one of my complaints. If I get I got to dig up a complaint. It's certainly not the talent. The, the talent right now is some of the best talent mm -hmm. that, that's in this business on both sides that I've, I've ever seen uh, overall. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I think, I think, I think, and I don't think it's production because the production work is 10 times better than it was back in my day. And, mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, guys, got old guys like in a truck now, Kevin Dunn's and then the, uh, Marty Miller's now, and then those guys and the creative guys, they put a great product out there, but it's you got to live it so quick and so fast, you don't have time to digest it. And I'm going to bring up, I think, one of the reasons why this Uso thing is getting over so well mm -hmm. because it's had such a long time to grow with us. Yes. You know, where these other things, you know, it, it's a shotgun, man, it's boom. If it don't stick, man, we're on to the, we're on to something else, you know, and, uh, and so I think that that's my probably biggest complaint that everything is done in such a fast motion. But I'm not pointing a finger at production. Yeah. I'm not pointing yeah. a finger at talent or, or anything like that. I just think it's the way of life. Vince used to describe that we're going into a sound bite era. You know, we're mm -hmm. better drive by. You know, the reporter runs up and it's a sound bite. Two minutes and you know your attention is gone. Next story. <laughs> yeah. And well, so that's kind of yeah. the way I equate it now. So, yeah. Well, and for me, that I will say that the thing that I ha don't like, will have not <laughs> like, my only complaint is, yeah, the Usos thing is working because we've had time to digest it. They've kept. I think the Usos storyline is probably the longest storyline that WWE has probably had. In a long time, yeah. In a long time, lasting past two or three weeks. Yeah. And I just, you know, I, 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 and that's what's making it successful is that, you know, you're giving time for the audience to be invested in it. I feel like that's part of the, also part of everything moving so fast. We're not really getting time to digest and get into a storyline because I tell you, some of the best storylines, you know, I mean, that whole thing with the Stone Cold Vince McMahon versus Mr. Yeah. McMahon thing. I mean, that, that was three, I was three years in the making, you know. I yeah. 
Oh yeah, and it was just it was just good storytelling. It was r- the rising action, the hero loses and he has to come back and you know, and it was just we like the hero's journey and I feel like that's kind of what's missing. And I don't maybe it's maybe it's not missing, but maybe what it is is that they just don't let it take enough time. They they oh, if it's not catching the audience within a week or two, they just move on from it. And I'm like, well, if you probably would have let it go for a couple more weeks, it, it, they would have had more time to get invested in it. Cause it had something. It's just that you got to let the chemistry build sometimes. I, I, I mean, that's just my observation. Well, um, uh, I think that's a, a very astute observation too. Uh, it echoes what I'm saying there. You just don't have time to, to take it all in, absorb it and say, this is, this would feel good. I like this. Or this is man, These guys yeah. are, are jerk offs. I don't like them. You know, let it build. <laughs> You know, why don't you like them? You know, well, it did one thing. Well, you yeah. know, back when we built a hill, there was a multitude of things that you didn't like. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, real quick, uh, before we end this, I've got two minutes left here. Um, what wrestler in the entire, right now in wrestling anywhere, uh, really stands out to you as a really big name talent with a big future? Oh, wow. It's a big question, um, I know, but <laughs> I know there's a lot of a lot of great talent down there. I'm gonna say my son Wes Briscoe, give him an opportunity. I think he could he could be a, a, an outstanding talent. But talent that's on TV right now, uh, man, you know, I, I I'm not gonna say anything because I don't want to piss anybody off. There, there's, <laughs> there's that's fair. There's, there's, I, there's I, so I respect good, that. There, there's so let me finish. There, there's so much good talent out there that. I'm envious of the talent level of these guys. The the moves that they do now. I mean, I wouldn't even uh, attempt it with my big butt. You know, I'd, I'd break every bone in my body with some of these guys. And you, then you see guys like, you know, guys that I, I love, like like Roman, like like Randy, who's out because of an injury, like Edge. You see the real masters of the trade. Then you see some of these young guys coming up. And I'm a big NXT fan. I watch them. Uh-huh. And I got the Creed brothers, of course, over there. I like D'Angelo. I like a lot of their divas are really talented. And that's a at at the division of, of the business that mm-hmm, mm-hmm. man, it's not even the same that when, you know, the two careers that I had, you know, when they're you know, they changed so much, but they've even changed again. With them being so athletic, with with uh, with some of these young ladies that are out there now, so you know it, it's a, it's an overall effort. But I, I I'm not going to name one guy. I think you know <laughs> I, I named my favorites with, I, the, I, with the Reddies and the Edge yeah. and the guys like. And there's one other guy that's been around 15, 20 years that really really grew on me, did and they grew on me because of his hard work and his dedication to to the to the to, to the business. And that, that's that's Miz. When Miz first started oh, out, yeah, you know, yeah. he was a guy. He was a guy. He was a guy. We we're talking about earlier, soundbite guy. You know that was just you know two minutes, and that was that was his best. But over the years, he's taken his business to heart, and he's learned from some of the best in the business. And the kid has now grown into one of the greatest superstars, I think, in WWE uh, annals. Yeah, the Miz definitely has. He has been a. Um, he, if you look back at just his elevation of like how much of good of a hill he can be. Yeah. And I wish he'd be a hill for good. You know I mean? Uh, you know, that's one thing to make up your mind, you know? And, oh yeah. You know, there's guys like, like guys like JBL that was a, a hill and didn't mind being a hill. <laughs> Man. And loved being a hill, you know, and that it personified what a hill is all about. Miz can be that same type of character. They, Miz and JBL were a lot alike. Their character that you love to hate. You know, and, oh man, uh, yeah. Jay, and speaking of JBL, yeah, he was just good at being bad. Like, yeah. just when he reinvented himself from you know the acolyte, yeah. um, thing. But, I mean, it just being a JBL, just that character oh, alone. Well, was, Miz is a lot like JBL. They're both uh, very intelligent young men, and they they know they know the buttons to. To push and then once you find that button once you find that method all you got to do is change the verbiage a little bit you know you can keep the same attitude and they've done that you know mm-hmm. I, I definitely think Miz's best best role is as a heel oh i i absolutely agree we saw him live here at a springfield event live event here a few months back and i had never seen him live Little shrine mosque that was my that was my place 
That was yeah, oh yeah. The shrine's still standing. They still have some in, indie wrestling matches there. Yeah, oh, I went to one a awesome. few years ago. Oh. Um, yeah, and we filmed a, a couple of scenes outside the shrine when we were filming the Flying Greek documentary. Because you know, and by the way, that Flying, Flying Greek documentary, if you folks haven't seen it out there, take a look at it. <laughs> it's on one of my very dear friend Mike Pappas, and uh, who turned into a, a jeweler there in, in uh, Springfield. Just kind of ra- uh, tell them tell them a little synopsis of that. Yeah, well, thank you. I appreciate that. It's uh, yeah, it's just a um, a documentary about Manoli Savinas, who was, as you said, he became he's a, he was a jeweler in Springfield, Missouri, for over forty years, and but in the sixties and seventies, he was a world renowned professional wrestler known as Mike Pappas, the Flying Greek, and I ended up doing this documentary on him by happenstance because he was on a talk show, local talk show that I was working behind the scenes on and. Here he is talking about Andre, and I was just like, how is this guy in my backyard? I've not known this. And <laughs> so I just reached out to him, and he was telling me stories about Randy Savage and Andre and Terry Funk and Dusty Rhodes. And he was named – I mean, he went down a whole list. and I was just, He was with all of them. He was a star. Oh, yeah. And so when I – I just I, I had to make a documentary on him, and um, unfortunately, he just passed away a couple weeks ago. Um, but – I'm glad that I was able to preserve his story and that so many people are having such a positive response um, to the film but who have seen it so far. So I appreciate the kind words, Jerry. I really do. Thank you. Well, it's um, outstanding work. I appreciate it. I appreciate you carrying on a legacy of, of an outstanding man who didn't get a lot of ink and didn't get a lot of uh, uh, coverage, press coverage back in those days. But uh, you you get did him justice, Jason. I'm proud of I'm proud of you for doing uh, it. Well, thank you, sir. I really appreciate that. That means a lot to me. Um, and there's even more wrestlers I would like to, you know, even do more stuff on that people don't know about. And I'm st- kind of trying to get some stuff going. I'm actually t- talking a lot with Medusa, um, friends of her, and yeah. trying to get some stuff going too for some other projects, hopefully down the line. But her, hus- uh, her husband's a real hero too, you know. That. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. He is. Yep. And, um, you know, I'll tell you this wrestling got me into what I do. And I told Medusa this the other day, whenever she, I was on her podcast, um, if it wasn't for professional wrestling, I wouldn't have gotten to filmmaking because my friends and I, and even though I know that you guys had those, don't try this at home yeah. I, and I apologize, but <laughs> my friends and I, I wanted to be a professional wrestler. Growing <coughs> up. And so when I found out how the business, I caught on to how the business worked when I was a teenager And usually some of those people who, when they kind of figured out how wrestling was, they kind of walked away from it. But I kind of gained a respect for it because it became more of an art form to me because I, whenever somebody tries to tell me that wrestling's fake, I say, well, let me put it to you like this. Wrestling to me, what it is, is it's a live action choreographed stunt show where the wrestler has to be not only an athlete, they have to be a stunt person and they also have to be an actor all in one setting and when i tell people that it gives them a new perspective on it and they don't they they changes it kind of changes their view of it and my friends and i would get together and we started doing these wrestling little wrestling events for our friend with our friends and i don't know how this happened jerry but one day at church our youth pastor was like, we need to do some uh, type of event to get some people to come to our events. And I said, hey, let's do a wrestling event. And mm-hmm. without skipping a beat, my youth pastor goes, okay, you want to do that? And I was like, are you serious? Mm-hmm. And, and I ended up with my friends and my brother, we ended up writing st- characters and storylines. And I went in, we went in that day and we choreographed on the hay, we had, it was in a barn, so it was hay bales uh-uh. everywhere. And we choreographed the entire match, and we went over it for hours. And that got me into directing, which led me into doing live huh. theater, which led me to wow. do film. So doing this film on Mike Pappas, The Flying Greek, and meeting Medusa and doing some work with her, and now talking to you, it's kind of like wrestling has always kind of been in my blood. And it's kind of yeah. like I've come full circle. Oh, great. You know, and it's talking with people like what, – what, just talking and meeting people like you – and um, that it just reminds me how um, how cool and how much more there is like to people when it comes to 
the wrestling business. I love, I was backstage at StarCast a few years ago and I was recording Medusa and I looked over and Jerry the King Lawler walked up to me, huh. next, next to me. And I'm sitting there and I said, man, if my eight year old self could see me backstage uh-huh. right now talking and joking around with Jerry the King Lawler, Medusa, and gosh, there was, I forget who else was back there. I was just like, this, uh, my, my inner, that my eight year old self would just be laughing yeah. and say, no, you're <laughs> lying, you know? And yeah. it's, and then Medusa actually took a picture of Jerry and I together. So I have that now. I thought that was pretty cool. But, you know, um, is there, um, with the current state of WWE, there's this, it, it, it's going through a lot of changes, um, you know, but of course there's, also dirt sheets that are putting stuff out there that we don't know if it's true or not. Um, but do you, and it's up to, I'll, I'll leave this up to you if you are able to comment on it or whatever. Um, do you see Vince trying to sell WWE to get it back as a private company? Uh, you know, I'm so far away from the product now. I, 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 you know, I have no clue what, what vent and I don't think anybody has any vent, but, uh, that's you know, that that's an option and, uh, you know, that, that he has, but, you know, I can't, you know, a lot, a lot of people saying Vince is going to take the company. Vince is not going to tank that company. He got too much pride and he, he, he got yeah. everything to lose and nothing to gain by doing that. And, you know, he's already yeah. healed. He's already <laughs> hated by everybody in the world. So <laughs> he don't need to, yeah. need to do something like that. And he wouldn't yeah. because of his ego and because of his pride, you know. Yeah. He yeah. loves that company. He loves that company more than anything in the world. And uh, if anything, the company, the stockholders are going to be pleased with what happened uh, happened in the company, in my, 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 my opinion. You know? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for commenting on that. I know that, you know, that's all. Oh, everything right now is speculation and stuff too. But I always yeah, it's total speculation. You know, I'm like everybody else. I'm curious, and you know, I just read on 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 one of those sheets. You know, that the talent found out by by going on social media. So they're 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 just like us. But you know, there there's people that's in the know, and you know, I, I'm mm-hmm. friends with those people that are in the know, and I'm not going to put them in a position where they gotta gotta. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, tell me yeah. something that's not going on, you know. So oh, absolutely. none of my business. None of my uh, business. You know, I'm, I'm a <laughs> stockholder. I'm a stockholder in the company. So I got absolutely. a vested interest. I got a vested interest in what goes on too. So <laughs> Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. And forgive yeah. me, I wasn't trying to pry or anything. I was yeah. just curious yeah. for yeah. Well, I know well, you, you, asked a, you, asked a, you asked an intelligent question. I can try to give you an answer to that. Well, <laughs> well, I appreciate that, sir. Um well, and I think when we talk about the business. What is it to you that makes wrestling exciting for the viewers? Well, I, I I think the the personal touch. You know that you can you can get that feeling where you you despise somebody or you really really admire somebody. And I think we give we give we don't cover our athletes up, you know, in helmets and pads and stuff like that and jerseys, you know, and, uh, mm-hmm. we get up close of them and they get to know you personally. I know in my day, you know, that, that personal appeal, you know, because we had more of a personal appeal because there wasn't the masses of people that was out there, but for that time it was, it was huge. But I think, I think people, we give people <laughs> good and bad. And we give them a reason to cheer, and we give them a reason to boo, and we encourage them booing either way. So I think they, they get involved like that, the, the emotional attachment that, that we offer our, our fans out there. I think that's what attracts people to mm-hmm. us and keep them there and keep them there too. I mean, I, I go through an airport sometimes, I'll see a grandma, huh, somebody like me, old. Oh, I knew you, you know, I, I used to watch you on TV. It makes me feel good, you know, but, yeah, yeah. you know, they had that emotional attachment to me you know, after all these years, you know, yeah. and that, that's a good feeling for, for an old timer, you know, or oh, anybody. Yeah. Well, absolutely. Well, I have to ask you this one last question because you also, for a spell, were, you were the hardcore champion during the <laughs> Attitude Era, and I love it. My, my favorite wrestler of all time is cactus jack yeah um and mick foley is just great and so yes. i always liked the hardcore wrestling and and if i recall you really took some 
Oh, it's wow. A, it's a, it's a, a beating every now and then when you got in those matches when you were defending that belt. And most of them were against Mick or, or Bob Holly or Crash Holly. And they, those guys, were, they, they they were stiff out there with it. I mean, I was an old man, and they didn't care. I mean, that, that was yeah. another thing that gets overlooked a lot. Pat and I were, you know, we're senior citizens at that time. But we were in a ring with, with young guys like Stone Cold, Undertaker, Kane, uh, mm-hmm. Mick Foley. Those guys like that that were trying to get over and trying to earn money and trying to get once again trying to get over, yeah. so they weren't going to pull no punches with two old men out there. If you couldn't, if you couldn't carry the load out there, they were going to eat you up and they were going to they were they were, they were they, you know get to you a little bit. So we had to fight back. But Mick Foley and I, you know, some of those uh, what do they call them uh, under the building. Uh, matches that we had uh oh boiler room brawl or boiler boiler room brawl matches like that (laughs) i mean they they were i thought i thought mick was gonna gonna drown me one time i mean in a a fountain there he held my head underwater while he's cooking i I remember that i'm I'm fighting and i got a helmet on i got a football helmet on i got a bunch of (laughs) gear that uh, that's hindering my breathing oh oh my god i remember that there hurry up with this damn promo mick you know (laughs) But I had such oh great chemistry. I had such great chemistry with Mick too. You know, there's so much to compete with him. Man, I, I remember those <laughs> matches, but you, I totally forgot that you had the helmet on that one time. Oh yeah. God, that just brought that back. That's so beautiful. I'll have to go back and watch that now. Oh man, yeah. that was just yeah. brilliant. Thank you yeah. for that memory. That was so fun. I love it. Um, but you know, with speaking of Mick, when he fell off the cell, or oh, you know, wow. just, um, yeah. I remember you and Pat and everybody being out there. What was going through your mind? Oh, is he alive or dead? <laughs> so yeah. Everybody else. I mean, we were, you know, and it just come as a, wow, that really happened. And, you know, it just takes a second for you to believe that really, a hey, Mick really did that, you know, and, and take her frozen time up there too. You know I mean? We're all frozen in time until we found out Mick was okay. Then he goes out and repeats a damn bump through the top. Oh, I know. Cause, cause if I recall you and Pat were trying to get him and uh, Terry, were trying to get him to stay, come back off the strip. He, yeah. We were some that were the first ones out there. We'd come on back. You don't have to prove anything else to prove. No, I got something I want to do. And, and he, he did it. And he got up, and I mean, I remember you guys yelling at him, like, "What are you doing?" And I was, yeah. just and that was going, all legit. That was all legit. Oh too. no, I know. Oh, I know. I like, and that's the thing about wrestling. You can tell yeah. when, for for me, and this is what I tell people. I'm like, it's like if you're watching a movie or TV. If they can suspend your disbelief in what you're watching, you're entertained. They've done their job. No. But there's moments when, hey, Fabe becomes shoot in a real moment yes. and it gets worked into what's happening and sometimes you get some of the best and most memorable and sometimes they're scary moments and yeah you get the best tv you can possibly get then yeah and i i just remember that whole thing because i mean he uh you know i will say this this is the one thing that bothered me was that when he would come back and do cactus jack uh, which was the most badass character that he yeah. ever created. Right. That he didn't win a lot in WWE when he was there, no. that character. Now, don't get me wrong. I think also he was doing it whenever he, him and Triple H had those going back and forth with. And Cactus it was done and by him. design because when yeah. he came in the next character, he did he did get a, a come up and zen. Yeah, exactly. You know, and he did. It was just that I I, I just. There was just something about that Cactus Jack character that's yeah. just. I agree. I I, that was a that was a badass character. Yeah, and that the music, whenever that yes. music would come on, I mean, I would jump out of my seat. Oh, Dude and, Love was my personal favorite, though. Oh, did you like Dude Love? <laughs> yeah, Dude Love was yeah, cool. Yeah. Well, because that was yeah. his uh, character from uh, that he started off when he was just doing stuff in his backyard when he was. Yeah, kid. exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it has a little bit of a legacy there, and I love that whole thing too when Triple H was out there on Raw. Mad, bad mouthing them, and then you had cat, you had mankind up on the screen, and yeah. then suddenly dude love is sitting there, and they're talking to each other. Yeah, <laughs> and they're like, "Well, I got somebody else that we can, I think wants to say hi." And then when he walked across the screen with the trash can, and he started yeah. doing that voice, it, 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 and you know what's really funny? They all sound the same, all those characters, but he does something a little different in his voice that you can tell yeah. the character difference. And when he did Cactus Jack. The way Triple H freaked out, 
I mean, that was just beautiful. And I love Triple H, too. I mean, I thought he was great. Oh, yeah. Oh, his, his, reaction, his reactions. I mean, he, he gets undersold a lot of being a great, great performer. But he was. He was, he was fantastic. He was a great, great that guy. Was great. Yeah. Well, and I will ask you one more thing, and we'll call we'll wrap this thing up. I just I'm having so much fun talking to you about all this too. It's <laughs> great, Mem- like it's just a going down memory lane for me. But what is there a certain match that at a, during from the Attitude Era on, like during that time, that in the early and even to the early two thousands, that stands out to you as a match that just when you when that match was over, you just like okay, that changed. That was a paradigm shift for wrestling. Like the bar got raised. It was LA. It was LA WrestleMania. I can't put a number to them because I did so many of them, and, you mm-hmm. know, and so many of them were great. But it was Kurt Angle and, and Shawn Michaels. And I'll, I will say this: just about anything that Shawn Michaels did at WrestleMania, just about anything Kurt Angle did at WrestleMania, mm-hmm. are, are, are some of my favorite memories. I'm, I'm a big, as you can tell, big Kurt Angle fan and a big Shawn Michaels fan. You know, and. Uh, and the, the, the Iron Man match with him and Brett was, you know, and I've seen a lot of our Broadways. I've been involved in a lot of our Broadways, but that had some of the best storytelling in there of, of, of any classic 60 minute match out there. So, you know, there, there's, there's, but I'll say it, just about anything with Kurt or Sean in it was, was some of my favorite movies. And, and, and towards the end with Taker too, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were they were, they were classic moments. I, I was just like everybody else. I was shocked and disappointed when when uh, when Brock, who was one of my favorite all time guys, also when Brock uh, broke the streak. I was hoping yeah. that streak would never be broken, and then you know yeah. that 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 if somebody did, it would be one of these young guys coming up that we just build that program. You know, this guy's yeah, you know, just boom, a new one. You know, but it'll never be broken, and I'm glad. The, the record yeah well that was a uh, yeah and undertaker was great and i even love some people don't like this part or this one version of the character but i love the whole ministry of darkness oh, i did too i i love, I love the, the, whole, the whole the whole deal you know i loved american badass too you know oh god yes like that. that was beautiful yeah, that yeah yeah well and he, he in he is one of the ones too in wrestling that always reinvented or built upon himself yeah. and that's and, a skill I mean, there's certain guys that can do that and taker was definitely one of them and taker was the first one that knew he was getting stale and knew he needed a change and he yeah. would start working on that change month to month before anybody even realized you know what he was doing yeah yeah well because i remember when he wrote wrote out in that on that motorcycle and he was coming out to limp biscuits rolling yeah. and stuff. And I was just like, okay, I'm sold. Let's, let's do yeah. this. <laughs> you yeah. know? Um, I saw, yeah. And, uh, I still got to find me a dead man incorporated shirt. That was also one of the coolest shirts ever. Um, yeah. but yeah, Sean and Kurt, they had a lot of great matches too. Um, what did, does any of the TLC matches stand out in your mind? Well, the, the the first one, not the first one uh, with uh, the razor, even though that was a classic, but the, you know, when they got when they got six guys involved, and those six guys were just just perfectly made for it, even though Bubba Dudley's body and 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 one made for heights or anything like that, neither a Devon, but Edge, yeah. Chris, and uh, and the uh, Hardys and and uh, and the Dudleys, and those table at TLC matches, wow, they scared me. They were so good, they scared me. You know, oh, being yeah. backstage and knowing what was going on. I was I was fearful for the guys. I didn't want anybody to get hurt. Was there ever a match? Did you? Uh, was there ever a match that you produced that um, stands out in your mind? Yeah, uh, Bret Hart and uh, and uh, and Stone Cold and and uh, when, uh, and uh, and Chicago WrestleMania. What was that fifteen or thirteen or one of those like that? Was that the one where he uh, got? That's the one where Stone yeah. Cold got busted open, right? Yeah, both of them. Yeah, 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 yeah. Great. That that was a that was a great match. So you produced that? I didn't know you produced that. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember. I remember. You know, they used everything, and there was it was a Target store right across the street from the in. Well, we uh, I think uh, Stone Cold. We've used everything, but 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 the kitchen sink. I said, "Do you want one?" He said, "Hell yeah!" So I sent him down, <laughs> one of the guys across and grab a kitchen sink. So we and we never used it. <laughs> we used everybody <laughs> there's like but a kitchen sink. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious! That's awesome. Well, that's great. Uh, well, um, you know, Jerry, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. This has just been. I could talk to you for hours about this. I love just talking wrestling with. 
uh, thank legends you. like you. And thank you for all the wonderful memories. I could keep going down memory lane with you. And I gotta <laughs> I gotta go back and watch that one with you and Mick where you had the yeah. helmet on. I totally forgot about that. And I'm, <laughs> I'm still gonna watch it tonight. Hey, you went with my head down the water, you 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 now you know what I'm thinking down here. Is he ever gonna <laughs> let me up? <laughs> Oh my gosh! Oh yeah, I'm gonna yeah, I'll have to do <laughs> to watch that soon. We're done here, but you know, thank you, sir, and I hope that we can meet face to face sometime. And just uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Jason. I appreciate it too, and I appreciate your work you you did on our on our friend Mike. So uh, God rest his soul, and thanks a lot. And have a have a good weekend. Stay warm out there, Missouri. Hey, thank you. <laughs>